So we're going to talk to scientist, doctor, medical doctor, and PhD doctor, Kaf Drasa. Yeah. Welcome to the Sign Mic stage. Well, thanks so much for having me. Glad to be here. We're going to have to get real close to the mic, just heads up, because everyone wants to hear your voice and what you have to say. All right. Is this better? Yes. Great. That's much all better. Right. Um, and we are going to talk about, first of all, I watched this, a couple of things that you did. Um, and you talked about how you went into science because you were just curious about everything. You everything. just wanted to know everything. about everything. The whole wide world. So everything. can you, let's just start with like, let's start chronologically, childhood. Uh-huh. And what were you most curious about? What is the most like ridiculous, fun story that you like to tell at like dinner parties? Like, So, so I'm, I'm one of those that like grew up when Star Wars was coming out, yes. I remember watching it on Beta, right? Just to sort of. <laughs> we are probably the same age, so. <laughs> and, yes. there, and there it is, right? I had a Jawa doll, you know, the one you could squeeze it and its li its yeah, eyes would light up. I don't know where one. those are, but I don't think they sell those anymore. Yeah, no, we used to have bowling pins, and they were different colors, so we just Ooh. those were li our lifesavers, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. okay. I and, wish and those were real. They're not. Yeah, no. And so on weekends, yeah. uh, my dad, who was also an engineer, would take us to the Air and Space Museum. Oh, and so, so I lucky. like grew up in the Air and Space Museum. Yeah. And Just fantasized around. about space. Right. <laughs> yep. You went into medicine, though. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. There are. We need medicine in space. Yeah. No. 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 Well, one of one of my uh, my good colleagues always says there's outer space and there's inner space, right? I love it. And so it. I went to inner space. There we go. <laughs> that was a good transition. That's good, right? Yeah. That was slick. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, w I watched your TED talk and you talked about how, I mean, space is unknown, but like human brain is so unknown, right? Like we don't know what's going on in there, and things are like new every day. So. Can you kind of elaborate on that? Like, what kind of drew you to neuroscience and medicine? Yeah, it was a bit of an accident um, and definitely ties into Star Wars, of all okay, things. Okay, let's keep on so, going with Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. so there's, there's this scene, right? And um, everybody knows the story. Luke Skywalker is the chosen one, right? Yes. He goes to fight against this evil villain, Darth Vader. And Darth Harry Vader Potter. cuts off his hand, right? And then you see, there's like this, they're making this robotic arm that he's like moving and they're testing. And I was like, man, that is like so cool, right? So I'm finishing up undergrad, having majored in chemical engineering. And I'm going around looking at different universities. And I learned about this field called brain machine interface. Brain where machine interface. Literally okay. wiring robotic body parts yeah. into a non human primate's brain. And so the monkey is like playing video games, but it's also moving this robotic arm around. And I'm like, Star Wars, there it is. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I can, I can totally see it. I do have um, another question then. Like we have a theme, right? We have this theme of like towards science without walls. Like how does that relate into like studying the brain? Like what, what does, do scientists have to do to understand the brain more by getting out of their silo. Yeah, look, I, I was listening to uh, Keith speak in the last session, yeah. and he was talking a little bit about how quantitative people need to come together with the biologists, need to, because th those gaps between the fields can really limit our understanding. Yeah. And I always say the brain could care less about our disciplines. Yeah, <laughs> right? it the doesn't see is, these walls. Yeah, the brain is like chemistry, but it's also biology, but it's also physics. It's also electrical engineering. Right. It's also computer engineering. Right. And so all of these fields are locked within the organ, and our limitations in understanding is our inability to understand the gaps between the fields, but also to have conversations with one another. Right. I, I have a very interdisciplinary team in the lab, and one day we were all sitting around and, and talking and trying to describe something, and someone used the word model. Right Now, model is something every scientist understands right. what model means. Yes. But it actually means something very different <laughs> to every scientist of a different field. <laughs> right? The model could be a design of a protein on a computer. A model for someone who's doing machine learning is the analysis program or the, the, the pattern learner yeah. that's generated. Or the process. Or the process. And so that simple word that means something to each of us, when we use the word, it creates a barrier of understanding across fields. So that's an example of the type of things that you need to bridge when yeah. you're trying to study something like the brain. Well, I, I watched a TED Talk that you did, and you talked about somebody who had schizophrenia and this idea of really what's happening in the brain is electricity. Like, we're thinking about that. Can you kind of elaborate on that? Because maybe, you know, somebody who's going to your session, somebody who's looking at this, maybe not have heard that. 
Like, what is that revelation that you were talking about? Yeah, so I, I always say um, there are two groups of people who are obsessed with precedent, right? Precedent. <laughs> two okay. fields, two areas, okay. right? Scientists and judges. Um, <laughs> it's unclear if <laughs> okay. the latter one okay. still holds. I can see but, this relationship. But scientists, we love precedent. We love what has come before. It sort of serves as our basis of understanding. It's comforting. Which means the pathway in which we got to learning is really important. Right? So if you think about a brain, right, we've always appreciated this organ in our head. And over time, people got better and better abilities to look smaller and smaller. And people discovered that there was these cells in the brain and this remarkable organization. All of that preceded our understanding of electricity. <laughs> right? oh, so our yeah, framework yeah, of definitely. how we think about the brain is in this biological framework. On the other hand, if we knew about electricity first, much of what we think about the brain would be based on physics, right? Yeah. And that as doesn't a, even... As a physicist, I like to say that it's everywhere. <laughs> exactly, <ahead. laughs> right? And that's not even thinking about quantum physics, right? right? Which we know exists as well. And so our framework of how we think about the organ is based in biology, and then we're applying fields on top of that. Yeah. And that might not be the right starting place for how to think about and how to understand the brain. So for me, my background is engineering. I immediately started thinking about electricity, right? Yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's electricity in there. How do we measure it? How do we find patterns in it? And how do we use those patterns to understand what is changing about the organ when somebody becomes unwell. Okay. And what has happened in that field? Because I that, that TED Talk that I watched was six years ago. So what has changed since you started thinking about electricity and like uh, treatments and stuff now? Yeah, there, there been remarkable, there's been a remarkable evolution in the field. And I think it's happened on multiple fronts. Um, first of all, our federal government has made remarkable investments in bringing together people of different backgrounds into the neuroscience enterprise. So in 2013, the Brain Initiative was launched out of the White House. Okay. The goal was to understand how the human brain worked. And so funding came into that. It was supported through 21st Century Cures as well. But a remarkable investment in bringing in physicists and engineers and biologists and pooling them all together to understand the human brain. One of the outcomes that came out of this was a new type of technology came about to measure more and more electricity in a brain, right? Wow, okay. So there are new types of electrodes and probes being used both in the preclinical space in animal models, but also being applied to humans who have disorders like epilepsy and measuring large amounts of electrical activity in the human brain and mapping that onto behavior. There have also been remarkable techniques and tools that have been developed to look at all of those simple biological cells in the brain and figure out what is the different types of genes that each of them have and how does that ultimately relate to what the organ is doing. And some of the newest outcomes of that have been published maybe in the last two or three months describing almost a cellular atlas of the brain, of the human brain. So okay. really exciting things that have been coming and, out. And do you think that breaking down like the barriers between like the different fields that are working on the brain talking about it as electricity do you think that's going to help with stigma yeah i well, you know i i always say stigma arises from a lack of understanding right so there's a you can look back in history and you know whether it was the plague and a certain amount of stigma that came along with it yeah and something like antibiotics can ultimately reduce stigma that comes along with the plague or whether you look back in the time when I was growing up HIV AIDS had a tremendous amount of stigma coming along with it yeah but the science progress that we made in coming up with treatments and cures have eliminated much of the stigma that goes along with something like HIV it's not as scary it's not as scary and so I think a a lot of the investments that are being made now in the brain space will ultimately help to come about with treatments, cures, and understanding of what is becoming maladaptive in the brain of those who have mental illness in a way that will be able to reduce stigma as well. I think mental illness is unique, right? Because what it really does at its core is it impacts our ability to relate to one another. Yeah. Right? So our ability to organize in terms of social systems and social structures and to work together and to play together. And so the illness itself disrupts interhuman interactions in a way that further facilitates the stigma. So what do you think, what are you most excited about then? Like in the future of your field, what is like the next step to kind of do this? Yeah, so I, I, I'm hopeful and I think that hope is really important. Right? If, yeah. you, if you look across our country, whether it's our, our young people, even before the pandemic, the, just the amount 
of anxiety and depression that our young people is facing. Now it's like two out of three teenage girls have persistent feelings of sadness and guilt and anxiety, right? So there's just a remarkable burden that people are facing in terms of mental illness. All of this upped since the pandemic. And many of us have experienced this in a really deep personal way as yeah. well. And so I'm hopeful that the investments that have been made in understanding the brain, the investments that have been made in thinking about how to come up with new treatments will ultimately translate to sort of reducing that burden of illness and helping people live, you know, the, the best lives that they can. So I'm, I'm hopeful. What would you say to like a graduate student who's going into neuroscience, who like wants to understand the brain better? Like, what is your encouragement for them? Like, <laughs> like to get into that field? What would you say to them? Yeah, so I think young people are, are really important and they're gonna become really important in solving their problems. And I'll say something that uh, people at my stage generally don't say, <laughs> right? Uh -oh. Which is, we have no idea what we're doing. <laughs> and, and I think it's important to say that because it yeah. creates space for the different perspectives that young people have. And it gives space for them to bring in their innovation, right? I just think, you know, we, I, I'm not as young as I used to be, right? But the world is even transformed. And the time, you know, I didn't have a cell phone in high school, right? Yeah. I, the internet was sort of barely doing a, its thing, right? Yes. There, were, there was no real iPad, right? So, yeah. so the world is entirely different. My cell phone now, right, is more powerful than any computer I could have ever imagined when I was growing up. And so the young people growing up in this different world, I think that they actually possess the solutions to the challenge, right? Yeah. And part of what's going to be important is them not listening to all of the older people people saying this is how it's supposed to be done, right? We've sort of been hyper ingrained in precedent in ways that we don't see the innovation, right? So I would tell the young people, be excited. There's lots to learn about. Like be more bold, there. like but say yeah, something. Like, yeah, don't, don't take everything we say as old folks say it at face value. Old folks, Stick to your guns. Please don't say we're old. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, I, Older. Think, I think that is, I think, I think that goes with the theme of this conference, right? Like I think that younger people going into the field just graduating from grad school or just graduating from undergrad, they feel nervous to speak up. They like, I have this idea, but I shouldn't say it because it's stupid. You know, like I feel dumb or like there is a hierarchy and I don't think it's my place to say anything, but you're saying do it. Oh, you got you to gotta push past it. So there are all of these weird, wonky ideas. Yeah. And, and some of them emerge because of the people who have had opportunities to participate in the science enterprise, right? Yes, yeah. So I, I spent a lot of time doing, uh, looking at preclinical models like mice. And there's always this historical perspective that the behavioral variance in female mice because of their hormones created too many barriers to understanding biological processes Ouch. in the female mice, right? And there's no doubt um, that this myth arose because there was much higher concentration of males um, in the scientific workforce <laughs> oh when you look God. 50 years ago. Okay. And so there's a stunning paper that came out earlier this year that it actually shows it's exactly the opposite. It's the males wow. that show much more behavioral variance, yeah. right? But this They're is less this, consistent. But it, this is it's just a it's just a really <laughs> clear example of why yeah. we need perspectives and we yeah. need to remove the barriers to those um, who have classically and historically not been able to participate in the enterprise for yeah. them to come in to bring their ideas and to overcome some of the bias that comes along with that past precedent. All right. With our last couple minutes, I'm going to uh, like promote your session. Yeah. So you have a session <laughs> tomorrow yeah. at 2.30. Um, to 3.30, and it's COVID research for the future data, status, statistics, and policy lessons. Is that right? No. Nope, that's not it. <laughs> I can I can show up and do yeah. it if you need me to. But it's reauthorization. <laughs> Sorry, am I wrong? Like you can tag me oh, at Saturday. any point in time. I'm here for it. <laughs> I, this is the wrong one. Okay, Saturday at 1 p.m. Yeah. Okay, at mile high um, ballroom level, and this is reimagining the NIH through reauthorization. Yeah, that's, that's the one. right one. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> you know, this is live, and we'll can't cut that. Um, what, is, what is reauthorization? But we can have a good time, we, right? <laughs> we can laugh at mistakes because that's what science is. This is what it is, right? Uh, what does reauthorization mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to figure it out, right? Okay. Between now and 1 p.m. Okay. No, it, it's, the, it's, the, it's the idea <laughs> that with many of our federal agencies, right, okay. there's an opportunity to periodically reconsider how well they've done, whether that mission should sort of be revised and updated for the next decade or so. They gave so. somebody money. Was it worth it? <laughs> 
and is there a way we can better use that money to so better achieve the things that our society needs for science to achieve, particularly in this case, biomedical science? So we'll be exploring that. Um, there, are, there are a group of us who have thought about this yeah. passionately. And the NIH is years. listening to you? Um, the NIH is <laughs> the NIH is sort of forced to listen to me for Excellent. better or for worse. Um, I, I spent a little time. I'm on the advisory committee, the NIH director, okay. so I'm a little bit harder to silence than I used to be in the past. Okay. But no, uh, they're they're incredibly receptive and open to ideas coming from different places. So it's it's kind of like a friendly audit. It's it's it, it's not quite an audience. I, I'd say it's a space for co-creation. Okay, right? that's Imagining a better way. What our, You're much more country, of an optimist than me. Not bad, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you, Kof, um Drasa. Yeah. For talking to me, doctor. Yeah, you're doctor, the only person doctors. that gets the Drasa right, by the way. Thank I'm really you. impressed. I want everyone to hear that. <laughs> I need. I it's just, recorded, so they can yeah. hear it over and over again. Thank, thank you, Drasa. <laughs> doctor Drasa. It's been wonderful talking to oh, you and pleasure. laughing with you. It's awesome. been great. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> All right. We get a lunch break.